Alrighty, so I'm just coming off one of my most ambitious episodes of the show to celebrate a huge milestone, and I need to get my bearings after such an undertaking. I put that disclaimer up at the beginning just so I won't have to broadside you with the pure, unadulterated trash I'm about to subject you to. In the same year that Project Aiko was released, the following anime that's going to be the subject of today's episode was also released. And it is the perfect testament to how, even though the 80s was a golden age for anime, not everything was all sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, and everything that's wonderful when we're together, brighter than a lucky penny. And that's fine by me, because bad anime is just easier to talk about. Frankly, an anime this bad might as well just be a trip to the Bahamas for me. A succulent pheasant for me to roast over an open fire. Delicious. Okay, I've done enough stalling. Let's talk about Root Search. So, plot summary if that even really matters. In the darkest far reaches of outer space, the space station Tolmechius Research Center is conducting psychic experiments on their consenting patient slash guinea pig Moira, who is dressed more like she's about to attend a Popeye magazine shoot than participate in clinical ESP trials. But after a fraction of a second of spending time with these characters that we barely know, Moira's ESP powers instantly start predicting that everyone aboard that ship is going to meet a bloody end. But before she can even shout out that the ice is gonna break in her best walking impression, a red alert goes off signaling that a gas mask shaped spaceship is distress warping near their station's vicinity. The only sign of life coming from the ship is its SOS beacon, and since Event Horizon has not been made yet, Moira and the rest of the crew decide to go check it out. Greeting the wayward explorers is a lot of death. But they do end up finding a survivor, a security officer named Buzz, who is badly wounded but impeccably dressed just like Moira. Such a perplexing situation really has Moira and the rest of the crew of scientists scratching their heads as to what could have done such a thing. But they don't have to wait long however because right on cue, the what that did that thing makes its grand entrance. <laughs> A nightmarish and incredibly Freudian looking creature has found its way onto the Tolmechius, and it is prepared for an encore performance. And we the audience soon learn exactly how this monstrosity unalives his victims. Through a horrifying combination of flashing strobe effects confronting the sins of your past, followed by death, a sci-fi flavored smoothie of psychological horror. Will Moira and Buzz escape this galaxy of terror? Will they do so before the animation staff runs out of their clearly undercut budget? Stay tuned to find out. Or don't, whatever, this anime's garbage. Root Search, also known as Root Search Life Devourer X, is an anime I've had in my back pocket for a while now. An anime so incompetently bad, it's not something you can break out every other day. This is the anime you save when you need to bust out an especially punchy script in order to accurately talk about something so laughable. But Root Search is also extraordinary in its awfulness because it's one of those OVAs that has quite the shady origins. A product of greedy businessmen who had a lot of ambitions, but were way too cheap to ever bring said ambitions to fruition. The inevitable backwash of an age of unrestrained economic freedom in the animation industry. So yeah. This anime is asking for it. And while I do have on good authority that this anime surprisingly has fans, nostalgia is a hell of a drug, kids, I don't think I'll be stepping on too many toes whilst I pay Root Search a beating. A good old fashioned, critical beating. <laughs> Let's get into the good stuff first and talk about how exactly does an anime like Root Search get made. For that, we turn to the tales of yore told by the grandfather of American anime fandom, the late, great Fred Patton. He was one of the founders of the first American anime club, the Comic Fantasy Organization, and he had also arranged a few trips for a legendary mangaka, Osamu Tezuka, to come out and visit America. One of these trips was at the 1980 Comic Con where he would present a showing of his just completed film, Phoenix 2772. 
There, Tezuka had brought a group of other anime and manga legends with him, partially to show off how there was a potential audience for anime and manga in America, however small it may be, and partially to humble brag to his colleagues that he was the first mangaka to have a devoted American fanbase. Patton was one of the group's American liaisons, and he cites this trip that allowed him and Tezuka to form a lasting working relationship with each other. On July of 1983, Patton received a letter from Tezuka saying that he would repay the favor of the Comic-Con trip by sending Patton on a two-week vacation to Japan that he would foot the bill for, permitting that he was prepared to leave almost immediately. Patton accepted, and was immediately flown to Tokyo. But while he was vacationing, he soon became aware that the god of manga had an ulterior motive. The major publisher, Kodansha, was about to publish Frederick Schott's Manga Manga, the first book in English on Japanese manga. Tezuka had planned a big dinner party for him, and he wanted me there to make it a two Fred dinner, and to present me to Kodansha's executives as the only English language expert who could write a companion book on Japanese anime. But because Patton's Japanese was not as good as Schott's, who was a fluent speaker of it and could write in it, the two Fred dinner plans fell through. But Tezuka talking up Fred Patton as this American expert of anime and manga did give him a level of visibility within the industry as the go-to link for potential stateside business, which is something the Japanese animation industry was looking a lot for in the 80s. Come 1985, Fred soon found himself in contact with a Japanese producer, Hiromasa Shibazaki of Hiro Media Associates. Hiromasa and his namesake company had kingly ambitions for the upward-trending OVA market. Rather than just focus on selling OVAs in Japan, he was also planning on making OVAs that could also appeal to the unique American sensibilities. Patton was immediately interested, and took the job offer that Shibazaki offered him. He was mostly writing articles in Hero Media's Globian magazine talking of the potential of the American market being exposed to OVAs, but it still was an opportunity to help Americans get copies of anime that weren't often on sub 6 generation bootleg tape. Unfortunately, the honeymoon period was brief for Patton. In the few face-to-face -face meetings he had with Shibazaki, Patton described him as the embodiment of the word sleazy. And while his ambitions were grand, he was reluctant to really put money in those ambitions. A lot of the anime productions he subsidized were drastically under budget and operated on a far more quantity over quality philosophy. You definitely see the production mess reflected in titles Hero Media funded like California Crisis and Dream Dimension Hunter Fandora. Uh, ah! This ended up being some bad news to a lot of studios who partnered with Shibazaki as they often found themselves making less money than they would with any other production companies. The reason why a talented studio like Konami Productions never made it to the 90s was because they attached their wagon to one Hero Media project too many. There was also the question of where did Shibazaki get the money to fund Hero Media's day-to-day -day operations. According to Patton, they seem to have come from various dubious loans. Read the Yakuza. <laughs> That's right, an anime like Root Surge was more than likely funded by money from the criminal underworld. Perhaps literal blood money was used to back this project. Even a golden age of anime can have its dark, seedy underbelly. Hiromasa Shibazaki's media empire was an incredibly short-lived one. Surprisingly, his titles never could get picked up by any American distributor, and not many Japanese fans were all that interested in buying anime like The Humanoid. Hurry up, would you? My coffee's starting to cool off. Fred Patton found himself out of a job in less than a year, and Globian would soon fold after its eighth issue. By early 1987, Hero Media ended up shutting down. Their OVAs disappeared from store shelves because the company could no longer afford to stock or advertise them, and their distribution licenses ended up being scattered to the four winds. Hiromasa Shibazaki disappeared shortly after that. According to Patton, it was rumored that he moved to New Zealand and lived under a new identity to escape all the debts he suddenly owned to various organized crime syndicates. And from all that craziness comes an anime like Root Search, barely a footnote in that history, just one of the many failed titles made by an even bigger failure of a production house. And for that reason, it's a fascinating anime. A futuristic odyssey into the unknown. I do sense a reluctance in the world of criticism to call something out as truly shitty because of the adage of, well, people worked hard on it. And I'm not denying that in Root Search's case. I'm sure there were a lot of animators working plenty of sleepless nights trying to get this out on the incredibly tight deadline Shibazaki put them on. If anything, that possibility makes too much sense. 
Judging from this anime's visuals, this is an anime coming from a team that's overworked, underfunded, and could not give less than a shit about the final product. Root Search credits Workhorse Studio Studio Live as its primary production studio, but it had seven other studios attached to it, which included AIC and Piero, and none of them show any sense of spark or imagination in the animated product. The entire setting of the anime is a barren space station, which feels more like an abandoned factory if anything. Cold, unfeeling steel walls with an occasional terminal and a door dotting the landscape, all of which is color graded in incredibly sickly blues and browns in a half-assed attempt to convey a horror atmosphere. Funnily enough, this is one of the two credits art director Yoshinori Takao has to his name, the other being which is entirely expected. This anime is also the first and only title director Hisashi Sugai has in his resume, and he was someone whose only other credit is on MD Geist as a production producer, which I totally buy as a completely legitimate job. I guess that's the reason why the only direction decisions that you can see in the animation is, is there any way we can make this cheaper? So many scenes are obviously of cells being flipped back and forth. There are scenes that rely on a similar posterized effect like in California Crisis, but only out of the way to make everything less detailed instead of any real aesthetic choice. And of course, we cannot forget the strobe effects. If there's any reason why this anime has never gotten a release outside of the early 90s, it's probably because of the flashing. This was a common cost-cutting measure way to edit effects back in the day that even good anime used. But after a certain incident involving a certain Pokemon anime happened, that animation method was effectively retired throughout the industry. But it's here, and boy do they ever use it as a crutch to substitute any horrific effect. It is the equivalent of the anime waving its arms and going, Ooh, are you scared yet? Check out how it's used to sell the horror of the world's most yawn-inducing death by explosive decompression. So not only is this anime ugly to look at, but it's also a potential health hazard. I will say, I do like Sanai Chikanaga's character designs in this anime, but only in a vacuum. I like how Moira looks in all her 80s glory, but it definitely clashes with the tone the anime is going for. Here you have this grungy sci-fi horror story about monsters attacking a space station, and then you got your main heroine running around in that pink lemonade beret looking like she's about to go record Sun Shower after this. But an anime with such suspect origins having bad at animation is to be expected. It's when you look at the hand who wrote this story, that's when things start getting a little weird. I will give Root Search this. If you were going to make an anime that completely rips off the popular sci-fi horror blockbuster Alien, then 1986 was the year to strike that hot iron. Not only was it the year where James Cameron's sequel had been released into theaters, but it was also the year where the most famous Alien ripoff anime, Gall Force, was released. And just a year after that, Lilycat would come up and it's probably the most alien of the Alien ripoffs. And yet, Root Search ends up being the worst of all the ripoffs released in this time period. It seems like it has an idea to add its own twist of the mysterious alien creature brace into an isolated spaceship full of juicy victims formula, but it never seems to want to fully commit to that. Nor does it ever want to fully commit to actually being a full-scale alien ripoff. It foregoes a lot of potential tension this anime could have had in favor of cheap scares and even cheaper melodrama. In an anime that has a lot of monster designs that look like half-finished concept art from Abadox, it appears that the main hook is the internal psychological turmoil that the main cast is going through, which is a totally fine avenue to go down, especially if it means the animators get to save time, money, and patience on not having to animate these monsters, but the character drama is not that particularly compelling in the slightest. For one thing, you don't really care about these characters because there was so little time to set up who they were before the killings begin. As far as we know, they're just lambs for the cosmic slaughter. It then tries to bring us aboard by having our victims for the evening hallucinate their greatest sins, all of which involves them betraying someone who trusted them before they meet their maker. But it all feels very basic, as if checking off boxes. Hey, the muscle-headed veteran feels guilty leaving his partner behind on an alien planet when he got attacked by monsters. Or, hey, the pretty boy womanizer character feels guilty for driving his ex-girlfriend to suicide because of his habitual philandering. And so on and so forth. 
And of course the anime tries to spice all this up by adding some half-hearted themes about the evil nature of humanity and maybe some thoughts about how the alien that's attacking him is an Asian of God who's angry at humanity for their inherent evil or some crap like that. It's putting as much thought into this stuff as I am currently writing and saying this paragraph. <laughs> But really, what makes such a half-assed script like this so strange was that it was written by the late Michiru Shimada, also known as the writer of anime like Little Busters and Little Witch Academia, someone who definitely is not a hack writer. And you can't even blame the badness on her being a newbie just starting out as she had episodes of Ursa Yatsura, Dr. Slump, and Dirty Pair to her name before Root Search was made. If anything, Root Search's script reeks of a weekend side project for a writer like Shimada, something that was banged out over the course of three days that never even got a cursory once over for editing. And I doubt either she, the animators, or Hero Media themselves even gave a shit because this was an anime that was meant to be done on the fastest of the fast and the cheapest of the cheap. Everything becomes clear in the very end when Moira and Buzz decide to sacrifice themselves by blowing up the space station with them on it to finally kill the alien menace. Ending with them walking into a bizarre eldritch landscape that's implied to be hell and them going, well I guess things are gonna be alright from here on out I guess. Yep, it ends on a total shrug. Or I'm confused. Is this a happy ending or a sad ending? It's an ending, that's enough. Root Search earned its status as bargain bin mediocrity. It was just another desire of a man looking to build a media empire through seeing the OVA market as a get-rich-quit scheme. Other than that, it was a complete waste of time. It wasted the time of the animators who could have been working on better projects. It wasted the time of Michiro Shimada who may have lost out on better screenwriting gigs doing this anime. It wasted Fred Patton's time by having him think that this was the only way anime could break through in America. It wasted my time by having me talk about this godforsaken anime for more than 15 minutes. But I hope it didn't waste your time. I need those precious watch hours. When more effort is clearly put into the VHS box art than the anime itself, which is uninspiring, passionless, and hard on the eyes, there's a problem. If Hiromasa Shibazaki is still out there somewhere, I really hope he's spending his remaining days looking over his shoulder for a bulky tattooed member of the Dojima family come to collect. At least it would be a fitting punishment for willing this lost cause of an anime into existence.